Hey guys, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is the daily show where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth. Coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. Gonna take a guess as to which one's my camera today. <laughs> also Aww. joining us. There I am. Yeah. I'm over there today. How you doing? Hey. Also joining us, Perry Nemra. Hey, guys. Excited for a really good show today. And I'm not going to look over to my right the entire time. <laughs> And that is because Mr. Jeremy Johns is next to her. That's me right there. This is what I would do in like tar any store, Target or something. But like, uh, 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 that's my camera right there. That's and also joining it. us, Christian Harlow. May the fourth be with you, you heathens. <laughs> that's right. That's true. Star Wars Day. Where May the shirt? fourth. Rocket. Fantastic. Uh, congratulations, everybody. I'm, I, again, I'm over there today. <laughs> I'm telling you, they keep moving. I think they're doing I now think it's just a game Good that the boy. production crew here is playing on me every single day. Okay. Uh, anyway, lots of stuff to get into today. What is first up? Deadline is reporting that Universal Pictures is finally moving forward on its Gears of War adaptation, setting one of the writers on James Cameron's four Avatar movies, Shane Salerno, to pen the script. The movie will not be based on any particular game in the series, but will be a new story set in the universe in which a squad of commandos living in a bombed out post-apocalyptic society battle swarm of alien creatures called Locusts. A release date has not been set. John, thoughts on Avatar writer Shane Salerno writing the Gears of War adaptation? I actually like the notion that they're just saying right up front we're not going to base this particular story on any one of the games we're going to take the spirit of the game we're going to take the scenario of the game and we're going to create a story around it I actually think that posi positions them for possible success now saying it's one of the writers on James Cameron's four Avatar films one of the 23 writers that James Cameron has in the Avatar films so how much influence he has on the Avatar films maybe he's the lead guy maybe he's just somebody who goes in and fixes the pronunciation on everybody else's words. Look, the three rules of life, uh, you know, taxes, death, video game movies suck. It's, it, it seems to be immutable, <laughs> unbreakable laws in the universe. I was so excited. You guys remember how excited I was for Assassin's Creed. I thought, this is the one. This is the one. And before that, I said, Warcraft, this is the one that's going to break open. The, even though I liked Warcraft, I completely get why everybody else didn't at the same time. And Assassin's Creed is just one of the worst movies of that year. Um, so I, man, I want to be excited for this. This is a good one. Look, if you want just an action, fun, some, some cool, like, violent drama and all that kind of stuff, this is a good property to build it around. It seems like they're taking the right approach, but I've been burned way too many times to get excited about it. Jeremy, you've played this game. What do you think about this news? Humbug. <laughs> bah! Humbug! Taking a, a video game movie, uh, taking a video game, making it a movie, not having it actually set in the video game, but keeping with the spirit of it, that's exactly what Assassin's Creed did. So it doesn't really tell anything to me. I'm with you. I've looked forward to all of them until I got burned to the ground and uh, with Warcraft and Assassin's Creed. I was like, these are the ones that are going to... No, it didn't bring anything on course. Mortal Kombat's like... The you remember when we did the top five mm -hmm. here? Yep. And about four of those things were abominations, maybe <laughs> three. I mean, you can't... <laughs> And you've both directed all four. Right, right. <laughs> it's one of those, like, the best video game movies are still like, all right. Mortal Kombat's hand, hands down the best. I feel like the time has passed. If it ends up being good, great, but I'm not holding my breath anymore. I just can't. Metal Gear Solid, the movie, is the one I might be on here going, maybe. But until then, no. What if, what if they came out with the Legend of Zelda Sands of Time or whatever that new one is called? Oh, Breath of the Wild? Breath of the Wild. It came out. That was being announced more. Would you get excited? Uh, what, is it a movie or is it a series on a streaming service? It's a movie. <laughs> no. Not Perry. En not enough. Yeah, I don't know about this. And I don't know about uh, him writing it either because I'm familiar with some of his credits, but he's most certainly not going to be the person who's going to get me to go rah-rah for another video game adaptation. I forget which uh, filmmaker directed a super famous trailer for these games, but that's kind of my only... That's all I know of it. So I know the look from that trailer. And, you know, I'm sure the game is great if you like it, but even seeing the visuals in that, I feel like I've seen a lot of that before. I forget what the creatures call that they fight in on this planet, but... But there's there's nothing about them and there's really nothing that I know of the story to make me think like this is going to be the one not so much from a visual visual perspective even but just from a storytelling 
hook. I need I need like a hook to get me excited, and I don't have that here either. I think the only thing that gives me some faith in this video game adaptation above some of the others are what you just said, John. Those quotes where you know they have the the franchise co creator saying this is a movie. Movies are a different medium than video games. Right, so yeah. you know what? If we're going to have to switch things up to make it work on the big screen, we're going to do it. So th that's probably the best thing I see in this entire story. Christian. I understand where you guys are coming from, but I completely disagree with you. I think this is a great idea. I think it, it, it lends itself to be an amazing franchise. But I understand we have not had a good video game movie. That's a fantastic face. I, I want to put that face. Uh, <laughs> I tell you, humbug. Like an old school Jim Carrey face. I like. It. Um, but I do. I absolutely think that this could be something really special. I think that it's set up for it, and the fact that they made those comments that they need to switch things up means that they could lend themselves to the fact that this is more of just a video game adaptation. It's just a good sci-fi film, like just yeah. a crazy action sci-fi film. But everyone has the right to say, we, you've given us nothing in the video game world. We have absolutely nothing to show except Mortal Kombat, and that's not a good movie. It's fun, but it's not good. Uh, we don't have a really good one yet. There's a possibility, and I think Metal Gear Solid also could be one. And are they still even doing that? And Tom Hardy at one point? They keep talking to... about yeah. it, but I mean, it never goes anywhere. I don't know, but I think that this lends itself to the possibilities of doing something pretty cool. The fact that he knows the Avatar world, whether or not how much involvement he had in the, in the full script, he certainly was a part of the process. And it needs to have that kind of feel, not, not to the, you know, the, what Pandora was, but just that cool sci-fi action film. So my, my fingers are crossed. At this point, I think they need to get to, uh, and then maybe it sounds like this is what they're doing, start with a great sci-fi action script and then wrap it in a, in a, in a skin yeah. of the game franchise. Then wrap it in a skin. Start with a great movie first, then wrap it in the skin. Because I still remember, man, 2015. How many times in 2015 were we on this show and we're going, <laughs> next year, guys, because yeah, we, yeah. we got Warcraft. Assassin's we got Creed. Assassin's yeah. Creed. Yeah. This is the year the video game movie genre is going to rise. <laughs> it's going to give the comic at, book genre a run for its at money. At a sports analogy, it's like, it's, it's like Theo Esp Esp Epstein, excuse me, Epstein taking over the Cubs. Yeah. It's like they hadn't won a championship in forever. We have not got a video game. Like the first person that does it, the first person yeah. that directs going to be legendary. Is going to yes. be legendary. The one because remember, superhero movies for the most part weren't doing great. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had ba Tim Burton's first Batman. You had a, you know you had Donner Superman, and then comic book movies were missing all over the place. Blade did all right, but there were movies that were just hitting and missing. Nothing's hit so far in video games. Absolutely nothing. The first person that makes it work is going to be legendary. I actually think they've dug themselves an even deeper hole because of that. You would think it's just the per the first person who makes it work is going to get a claim to fame for that. But I feel like the hole is so deep that it needs to hit the point where it's like, I mean like an Oscar-worthy movie because now you have all these people out there who are just going to be like, oh, I don't like video game movies no matter what. Like and that's going, to be, that's going to be the challenge just to prove them wrong, though. Don't want to be that person. Make, <laughs> make the face again. <laughs> what the humbug guys? Yeah. Well, camera can't be on me. Hold on, here we go. It's a trend. <laughs> yeah, right, now he's back. <laughs> yeah, now, now he's got it. Humbug, hi Grunchy. I did you humbug. <laughs> All right, <laughs> what's next? <laughs> okay, THR is reporting that Melissa McCarthy is set to star in the Happy Time Murders, an edgy R-rated puppet comedy from STX Entertainment. Ryan Henson is on board to direct the movie that is being billed as an action comedy, with the story taking place in a world where humans and puppets coexist and the puppets are viewed as second-class citizens. When the puppet cast members of 1980s children's TV show The Happy Time Gang begin turning up dead, an alcoholic disgraced LAPD detective turned private eye puppet takes the case with his former human partner. A release date has not been determined. Christian, what do you think about A Happy Time Murder starring Melissa McCarthy? Uh, sue me, because I know that it's 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 kind of in to hate on Melissa McCarthy right now. I love this idea. I think it could be a kind of new Roger Rabbit meets Team America. Uh, it is. It could be really cool. What was the, what was the the play? The one of the, with the puppets? That they Avenue did? Q. Avenue Q, yeah. like it's It's something along those lines, but Bring it into feature film. It could be really funny, and it could be something that just knocks people on their ass. It could also be an absolute disaster. But I think that an R-rated comedy and Brian Henson involved and Melissa McCarthy with these stinking puppets, I think, could be pretty funny. And um, I think it's a nice, uh, nice change to things. I remember uh, back when Angel was on TV. I actually re one of the few guys that I actually preferred Angel over Buffy, but yeah. whatever. And they did their episode where Angel was turned into a puppet. 
And I just remember watching that, and I was so thoroughly entertained by that that episode, thinking, why doesn't a movie try this at some point? And then this also reminds me a little bit of uh, Forgetting Sarah Marshall, that you know uh, Jason uh, Siegel's character was had this R-rated Dracula love story he wanted to do in puppet form. And stuff like that. This is a terrific idea. Look, this may turn out horrible. Like, this could be a hot mess on a really steaming bad plate. But... I think it's pretty creative, and I want to see where they go with it. And you're right, I'm not over Melissa McCarthy. I think, like any actress, Melissa McCarthy has some hits and misses. Absolutely. But when she's on, she can be really, really funny. And I think this is a really nice marriage. It's a really cool thing to try. We haven't really seen something like this before in a major Hollywood release, per se. So I'm down for this. What do you think? Yeah, nothing will ever... I remember the first time I realized Melissa McCarthy was great. It was in Bridesmaids, and a lot of us were like, oh my gosh, Bridesmaids was surprisingly good. It wasn't Gilmore Girls? It wasn't Gilmore Girls mm. for me. It was Bridesmaids. <laughs> I, I, I didn't watch Gilmore Girls. I played video games. But um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. Melissa McCarthy has talent. And this, I mean, that image right there, there's like a dead rabbit with stuffing everywhere. I mean, it's just, <laughs> I, the premise is so goofy, yet so. I just saw the sign. Vinny's puppet pleasure land in some kind of pornographic image. It's of amazing. It's there's like a, so there's a whole R. bunch of funny props behind her also. <laughs> It's it's it should be mature and rated R, but it's puppet, so it's not. But it is, and I, I agree. It could be a really irreverent uh, Roger Rabbit meets puppets. Anytime you mix live action with puppets, already I'm like, I don't know how this world can exist, but yeah. I like it and a lot. Team America did right, so right, well right. Well yeah, but that was like all puppets. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. this yeah. is going to be you know a mixture of it. But I agree, Team America was absurdly entertaining. So bring back some puppets. I'm down for this comedy. Fair. I am so happy to hear that this is finally happening because it's been so many years. I remember covering this image when it was released in like 2011 or 2012, and look at it. There, there's, there is puppet blood in the form of pink stuffing yeah. <laughs> coming out of that bunny. It's kind of like what I've been saying all along about we need to see Lego blood in like a Friday the 13th <laughs> Lego movie. This is such a funny spin on this, and I'm also a pretty big Melissa McCarthy fan, and it's not because I like every single one of her movies. I remember when Spy came out, I wrote an article for Collider.com where it was... It was basically saying Melissa McCarthy sucks when she plays stupid characters that are there to be the punchline of jokes. But when she actually plays someone who is smart and capable but can also be really funny, she is so insanely talented. And I think Spy is the perfect example she of something like Spy, that. Yeah. And what a great get for this project. This is what they needed because I think recently there were quotes from Brian Henson saying, you know, we've been working on this for so many years and it was about finding out a way to make this at the right budget level with the right people. And this was like at the end of last year. And he said, we're, we're closing in on finding those people and finding those financers. And clearly it happened. And you can't have it happen with anybody better than Melissa McCarthy. She's got some serious power in this industry. So you pair her with this concept and the fact that R-rated comedies are doing pretty damn well right now. And they've got a really great package here. McCarthy made a really nice comment about this project. She said, when a really good script combines puppet strippers, Los Angeles underbelly and comedy, it's like a fever dream has finally come true. <laughs> I love that. I love that comment. It's so true. Okay, what's next? As Get Out readies for a home release on May 23rd after racking up $172 million in domestic receipts, THR is reporting that director Jordan Peele has signed a first look deal at Universal, <laughs> setting his movie in motion that is an untitled social thriller he'll write, direct, and produce just as he did with Get Out. No plot details have been revealed, but the film will be bigger with a $25 million budget. Peel recently told Variety's Playback podcast that he was developing a movie alongside Get Out, one he said is meant to deal with a different human demon, a different monster that sort of lurks underneath the way that we interact with one another as human beings. No release date has been set. Perry, what are your thoughts on Jordan Peel sticking with his genre of films for his next project? Yes. Yes, I am so happy this is the story we're covering and not that Jordan Peele is officially signing on to direct Akira. Yeah. I want to see that Akira movie happen eventually, but when we were talking about it on the show, I said that is not the right next move for him. It's not what I think is a good thing to do for a filmmaker who made a great movie, a great first feature budgeted at $4.5 million and then go on to some sort of massive thing where there's so many corporate hands in, in the pot there. This is what he needs to do because clearly he's got great ideas and the jump from, you know, let's say $4.5 to something like a $25 million budgeted movie 
that's that seems reasonable and it seems like that's kind of the the route that more up and coming filmmakers should be taking because that that is the trend now you make one really great movie and all of a sudden you get snatched snatched up and put on a major franchise and it's kind of sinking a couple of really talented people that i was looking forward to seeing where they were going to go and you let him hone his skills for a little while he is someone who clearly with get out you could see it all over get out jumped into that really understanding what he wanted to do, how to achieve it, how to how to get his message across while making a scary and entertaining movie. He's such a talented filmmaker. I'm so excited to hear that he's staying with Universal. He's hopefully going to keep working directly with Jason Blum because they make a great pair. Yeah, I, I'm not one of these guys. I don't think Get Out was like one of the top three movies of the year, blah, blah. But I thought it was a really nice little film made with a really low budget with a brand new filmmaker who clearly showed he has his hands on the story and he understood the story. I'm with you 100% on this, Perry. The notion that he's not just got, oh, I got one hit, now I'm going to go make a $200 million movie. No. It's like, you know what? No, I want to make another one of these, maybe a little bit bigger, with a few more resources put into it and really see him grow and develop that. I think if he's this smart and he keeps doing that, he could become like one of the really special directors we've got going on today. And I'm also with you on the Akira thing. I, I look, if they said that he was gonna direct Akira, I'd be like, okay, like clearly the guy knows how to tell a story, that's great. I don't know how quickly they're gonna move Akira into production seeing how much money Ghost in the yeah. Shell just lost. Yeah. So I don't know if anybody's gonna right. be like, Ghost in the Shell made $40 million in the US. And it didn't even crack 150, or I think maybe like 160, something like that worldwide. So it lost the studio a ton of money. But I really like hearing the story. I think it sounds great. What about you? I think you're absolutely right with the the reason Akira maybe also got pushed back to Ghost in the Shell, which I don't think is fair. I think that it also should be blamed on the director. It should be blamed on the studio. I think that there's a good story in Akira that can be told and could be very successful. But that's not the way studios work. They work on, well, that didn't work, so that's not going to work. And Peel probably had now options. Well, okay, well, if you guys don't want to push forward there, I'm going to go ahead and do this movie, which was a smarter choice. I agree with both you guys, because he will get more power by building his resume with these smaller movies, because he clearly can do it. I'm with you that I didn't think that it was as great as everyone was talking about, but I certainly thought it was a really good movie. There were some great performances. As a director, he showed what he's capable of in that one movie that was a very, very nice way as your debut to say, this is what I can do besides just be funny. I'm a good director. He's a good director. And by doing these movies, by saying, now look what I've done here, then by his third movie, he's, he's if you look at what the paths of like Orion Johnson or even Christopher Nolan, I know we're not there yet. I'm, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is these guys started with smaller movies, built their way up, built their resume. And then by the time you get to that big action movie, they're like, there's nothing this guy can't do. What do you think? Yeah, I love the fact that it's like Jordan Peele's doing another movie. It's going to have a bigger budget. It's $20 million now. It's like that's a home run for the studio. They're going to make some cash on that when the director of Get Out's doing another thriller. It costs $20 million. Um, there was a part of me that took a step back because I don't want him to be locked into the whole you have to do a thriller that's a social thriller. I mean, there, there's a part of me that will be like, I, I, that, that shtick might get a little tired, but his explanation of it of it's a social thriller that has to do with the interactions and basically the social isms that people have when they interact with each other that fascinates me there are things that people do when interacting with each other that make you either roll your eyes or like why do people do that and he has he's shown that he has a good way of addressing that in thriller form i have faith in his next thriller i can't wait to see it all right, guys, we've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Natasha's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell. So, Natasha, what's up? Entertainment Weekly has unveiled first-look images at the upcoming Murder on the Ori Orient Express remake directed by Kenneth Branagh. The 20th Century Fox film is itself an adaptation of the classic Agatha Christie mystery, assembling a huge star-studded cast that includes Branagh, Johnny Depp, Michelle Pfeiffer, Daisy Ridley, Judi Dench, Penelope Cruz, and Josh Gad. The story takes place on a packed train where one of the passengers is murdered, leading Branagh's detective to take case in order to try and figure out what happened and why. Murder on the the Orient Express opens in theaters on November 10th. Jeremy Byers saw the first images from Murder on the Orient Express. I buy the images, I buy the crew behind it, I buy the director. I'm a fan of Kenneth Branagh and I I, I like what this 
is going to be. I've never seen the Murder on the Orient Express. One of the five like remakes and Murder on the Orient Express versions that have come out. I haven't seen it. Went on the Spirit of Washington dinner train, did a murder mystery <laughs> then. It's no longer around, but I did it. Murder mysteries on trains are a time-honored tradition. There's something really cool about uh, uh, su such a... Like it can only be in so many spots, you know, whatever it is is right in front of you. I don't even know if that's the premise, but it's called Murder on the Orient Express. So that's what I'm assuming it is. Perry. This is a huge buy for me. I love the look of these images. And this is not these images, but that EW uh, cover photo. That is the first Entertainment Weekly cover photo I've seen in a very long time that had me. Oh, my God, I need to see this movie. Look at the ensemble. The way that they had that ensemble lined up, you can't look at that group of people and not be completely overwhelmed by the amount of talent in this movie. And they're doing a really cool thing with the promotional campaign for this now. And it started with that EW cover where they're hiding clues in all the promos. And then you can go on their website. And you, if you find the clue and enter it in the right spot, they'll give you information on the characters. And, you know, it's not anything game-changing where you're going to get to see early footage before anyone else or something like that. But... It's just a really cool way to to get people into the story in a way that's kind of using the plot of the movie too. So look on that that EW uh, EW cover and see if you can find the clue, and then you go enter it in on the website. It's real. The first one is really easy to find. Christian, yeah, I'm gonna buy it for sure because I automatically think of the behind the scenes trailer videos that uh, Josh Cad, Judy Dench, and um, Daisy Ridley <laughs> did together. With. But no, I look at these images and it reminds me of Clue. Uh, I mean, now, whether or not right. they're going to do it in, in that vein, I don't know, but it certainly reminds me of it. And I and Kenneth Branagh, this is right up his alley. And I think that the biggest buy, the reason I'm buying it is because I know he's directing it. What he's capable of doing as a director, this is something that he could really lend his expertise to to make this a lot of fun, very interesting, work with a great cast. He's, a, he's absolutely an actor's director, and with this cast, that's what you want. So I think it could be pretty interesting. It's not going to be a gangbuster, like, big blockbuster movie with making a lot of cash. It's just not. Um, it's going to be a movie that we hope makes a lot of cash. But, um, yeah, I like, I like what I'm seeing. I got to buy this for a couple of reasons, mostly in starting with Kenneth Branagh. I mean, this guy, if you go all the way back to, like, his Henry VIII stuff and whatever, and then look what he did with Cinderella. I mean, it, this is coming off of, like, Maleficent, where we all thought, oh, gosh, these live-action Disney things are mm -hmm. not a good idea, this thing. And then they give him Cinderella, and he takes an incredible ensemble cast, and he makes that a wonderful, wonderful movie, even if you've never seen the original Cinderella. He did such a great job with that. He made Thor cool. He made Thor incredible. Yeah. That's why that first Thor movie was one of my favorites for a long time. You look, and then you give him source material like Murder on the Orient Express. This, I, I don't know how you do anything but buy this. So this looks great to me. It's a buy. What's next? According to a report from THR, Jeremy Renner is set to play John Henry Doc Holliday in a new film about the legendary gunslinger. Palm Star Media has optioned the rights to two novels entitled Doc, a novel and epitaph, a novel of the OK Corral, both of which will be developed into one film. The movie will detail the early days of Holiday in which he comes to the Texas frontier, hoping that the dry air and sunshine of the West will restore him to health. Soon, with few job prospects, Doc Holliday becomes a gambling professional, and while in search of high stakes poker strikes up an unlikely friendship with a fearless lawman named Wyatt Earp. There's no word on a start of production or a release date. John, buy or sell a Doc Holiday movie starring Jeremy Renner. I love the kind of little bit, it hasn't gone in full force yet, but there's renaissance of the Western genre coming and you get a performer like Renner, you get a story like this that a lot of people already are a little bit familiar with and they want to see that legend expanded upon. I, I, I like it a lot. I'm actually really excited for this one. For me, it's a buy. I'm going to sell it because I would have rather it been a, like a streaming series. I would have rather it been a, an Amazon series or a Netflix series. Um, I, think, I, I think I'm good with my Doc Holiday already. I already got Val Kilmer. I got Dennis Quaid. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm good with Doc Holiday in the movie. I don't know if – I like Jeremy Renner, Jeremy Renner as an actor. I think he's good. I just don't know if, if I need another film version. I know it's been a long time, but I think that I would – all these adventures and things, uh, things that I haven't seen already – could be better served as a television series. I mean, I don't know what they're going to cover in two hours that I haven't already seen on screen, but we'll see. It's true. As a, as a Tombstone fan, I, I do have the epitome of Doc Holliday that I love, and that's Val Kilmer in Tombstone. If, uh, Tombs, Tombstone. if you haven't seen that, please see it. But I do want to see Doc Holliday's life outside the Earps. You know, like what, what got him there? Where did he go? Granted, it's going to be wrapped into Tombstone for a bit because he moved there after, after he got, you know, the cough. But I, uh, I, 
I'm going to buy it. I like Jeremy Renner as an actor. I want to see what Doc Holliday's life is rather than just the Tombstone era. So, yeah, I'll buy from me. Yeah, I think I'm going to soft buy it. I don't really know if I need another rendition of this character, like Christian said, but Jeremy Renner is, is a very talented actor. Most of the things that I've seen him in recently that I really remember and love his performance is it's mostly coming from when he is someone really good to work off of. So while I don't really see him as a leading man, I see him as a leading man as long as he's surrounded by other talented people that kind of bring that out of him. So, you know, it depends who they find to direct and who they fill out the cast with will kind of dictate how excited I get about this. All right, what's next? Just as fans were getting antsy for Warner Brothers to kick in their marketing campaign for Wonder Woman, several new TV spots, including a new extended one, have landed online. The new look features a lot more action with bits of story mixed in featuring Gal Gadot's Diana Prince and Chris Pine's Steve Trevor. The new spots come on the heels of a report from Vanity Fair that states Warner's has already spent more on marketing for Wonder Woman than Suicide Squad did with the same window of time until release. Fans will not have to wait much longer to see Wonder Woman in action as the movie is less than a month from hitting theaters on June 2nd. Perry, buy or sell the new extended TV spot for Wonder Woman. I'm going to buy it, but that doesn't mean I love this TV spot. I think we've kind of hit, hit the peak in terms of Wonder Woman trailers and TV spots, and at this point, it doesn't matter how good they are, it's not going to hit the point where I get even more excited through right, those kinds of promos. Right. However, the second they drop a clip, if I see a clip from the movie and it's really damn good, that's going to kind of get me to a new level with me looking forward to Wonder Woman. But I think, you know, I've seen enough as far as quick cutting trailers go. Jeremy. Yeah, I think the clip is the only way we could go other than it looks like they're holding back in the trailers. Like, there's plot that we don't want to reveal. So all the trailers, they're looking very similar at this point. Every trailer I see, I'm like, I've seen that. I saw that months ago. And there's still a month to go. So I feel like the, the marketing is going to amp up and it's going to be more stuff that maybe I've already seen. I agree with you. I want to see a clip with dialogue between two human beings. And I want to see if that dialogue is good. I want to see if the acting is good because I'm excited for Wonder woman but again i haven't seen what trailers are it's very easy to make a movie look good with a trailer so i want i need to see a clip i'm with perry on this one but i buy the trailer i thought the trailer was good and yet some companies don't make their movies look good with trailers yeah, oddly yeah, enough true. uh yeah i'm completely with perry on the fact that i don't know how you get me any more excited for this movie because the first two trailers for wonder woman were just going all the way back to comic-con last year and then the big follow-up trailer they had after that I mean, those things just crushed it, and so I'm completely on board. Yes, I still have major res reservations about Gal Gadot's acting ability. To me, she comes across a little bit wooden in the thing, but I really do trust that a director like Lexi Alexander can do with her what James Gunn does with Dave Bautista and work around the weaknesses and really highlight the strengths. And the strengths of Gal Gadot, un, like, uh, without any doubt, was you mean that? Patty Jenkins? Did I say, who, I say Lexi Alexander? Did I say Lexi Alexander? Sorry, yeah. I was yeah, yeah. just looking at Lexi's Twitter account. Sorry. Um, <laughs> When you look at the physicality that, and that is a, that's a gift. When you look at the physicality that Gal is bringing to the Wonder Woman spot, I, I think sh she shines in those moments. When you see those moments where she's doing her action stuff, I think that's where she shines. It's when she's giving the dialogue to me, it's not so strong, but like I said, I think she is gonna be, I think Jenkins is gonna be able to work around that and make a really good quality film. I'm still excited for this movie. I think this movie is gonna be not just passable, I think this movie's going to be really damn good. I'm excited to see it. This, these spots didn't increase it, like you were saying, Perry, because I'm already there. So now I just want this damn movie to come out. Um, I'm going to do the same thing that Perry did. I'm going to just buy it, not because I don't like anything I say. I happen to like everything that I've seen. I just In these TV spots, I just have seen all of it already. I've seen <laughs> every bit. I've seen every joke. I've seen every image. There was nothing in there that I'm like, oh, well, that's new. That gets me even more excited for this movie. I'm already excited to see this movie. I understand it's the TV spot side now, so they're just basically taking the retreading and doing the same stuff that they were doing before. Um, but I'm ready to see this movie. I want, I'm, I'm done. I don't need to see anything else. So, yeah, but I still, I'll, I'll soft buy it. All right, what's next? We are actually on to our mailbag. Oh, I didn't realize that. <laughs> hey, actually, you know what? Before, I didn't realize we were already that far down the list. All right, guys, listen. Before we get into mailbag, I want to remind you that we're doing the show live. So at the end of the show, we're going to save a little bit of time, take your live Twitter questions. Make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video. Start firing in your questions, and we're going to have Wendy pick out a couple of those for, for us to take at the end of the show. I also want to remind you that Movie Talk is not the only show here on Collider Video. Like you guys know, all week we've been 
doing TV talk every single day, live at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Josh McCougan, his crew. So make sure you check out the newest episode that went up online a little bit earlier today. Also, a little bit later today, this man, Christian Harloff and Jedi Council. The newest episode goes up on that a little bit later today as well. And, of course, a little bit later, a brand new Schmodown drops between Josh Makuga and I can never say Tom. That's who he is. Uh, yeah, so Tom Dagnino. That's going to be coming up. Keep your eyes open for that. And, of course, a brand new episode of Awesome Tacular with Jeremy Johns and crew every single Friday. Check, Keep your eyes open for that. That's on the Verizon Go 90 network. Now, as Natasha was saying, we do have mailbag. If you've got a topic or question you'd like us to address, make sure you just send those to us at collidervideo at gmail.com. And we take those on the weekends on mailbag, but also here on Movie Talk Monday through Friday. So, Natasha, what's in the mailbag? Elijah writes, hey guys, love the show. How often do you think that the major studios watch online reviews and critiques about their upcoming movie and incorporate that input into the creation, marketing, and release of their film? Thanks for taking my question and keep up the great work, guys. I think, look, do, do, Mark, do studios pay attention to what's going on and going on out there? They absolutely pay attention. Do they pay attention to like some online critics and why the hell is that picture up there? <laughs> 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 Uh, do they pay attention to some of the critics in the online shows? Absolutely, because we are also, be, be, but because those critics and online personalities are just more reflections of also what's going on in the la larger fan audience to that degree. I know we had a whole bunch of people tweeting us saying things like, hey, you guys said they need to come out with a, with a Dark Tower trailer, and the next day the Dark Tower trailer came out. See, they're listening to you. That had nothing to do with us. I abs I'd, it would be great to think that was because of us, but I absolutely 100% guarantee you not so much. So do they pay attention? Yes. Or do they completely dictate what they're going to do by what people like us say? Absolutely not. Influence, sure. Dictate, no way. Anyway, Perry, how would you address that? Yeah, I, pretty pretty similar, especially when it comes to seeing early releases of a movie. And just as an example, because I was there, the Overlook Film Festival, they had the world premiere screening of It Comes at Night. There's no doubt in my mind that A24 and the other people that are working on that movie, and especially the marketing campaign, are looking at the reaction coming out of that. And a great example is when you see trailers where they have quotes, but instead of critic quotes, they're pulling from, from social media, Twitter handles, because that means they looked at the reviews and they didn't get the quotes that they wanted from the reviews most of the time. But there, I don't think that that extends too much beyond, you know, oh, because Collider said this about my movie, in the sequel, I'm going to do something different. Right, right, right. It's not to that extent. But I, I definitely think also because people that work in every area of this industry, I think a lot of them explore every other area of the industry. I know people who work in other other capacities making movies and they do watch our show and they read some reviews from particular websites jeremy yeah i mean youtube's only gotten bigger it would behoove any studio or company to see what the chatter is about their product and i mean youtube's only grown i can guarantee you that there are people who've seen our stuff and it's that weird moment where you realize that start like you know you had a john boyega interview and he goes i'm going to start this interview i love jedi council it's like yeah, john right. boyega watches jedi council that's crazy you know so i mean i it, you when you start realizing that people in the industry watch your stuff you start realizing if i ever meet megan fox she's punching me in the face <laughs> I don't, I don't, yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> well no i know for a fact that they absolutely watch i, I agree with you is yeah. that they they it influence sure but it dictate absolutely not i mm. think that it's there I, I ran into someone at star wars celebration that said that they watch someone pretty prominent that that watches the show and they they listen sometimes they laugh at the the silliness of the stuff we don't know and other times they go okay that's an interesting point and i'm sure that they listen and they and they pay attention to not only youtube personalities but fan chatter and all that mm -hmm. stuff when there's a majority if you do something and there's a majority of people out there that are saying we didn't like that or, or what about this i guarantee you in conversations people will come up and when there's creative meetings there's chatter out there about this. Is that something we want to even, you know, entertain? Yes, no. And sometimes they go, no, we're going to go with the course that we wanted to go. But it, I think that's the age of the internet. There are times that we, you know, certain things, perfect examples for, for Schmodown stuff. If I'm looking at certain comments and people are like, this, 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 and I'm like, well, that's interesting. I never thought about that mm. before. And I start maybe going off another creative path. So you never know. 
All right, guys, listen, before we get to our Twitter questions, I mentioned a little bit ago that there's a particular match that's dropping between a, a guy named Josh and a guy apparently named Tom, whoever that guy is. But let's get you warmed up for it with this. Bottom line, you're a loser. McCoovey's been losing for a long time. He'll stay losing, in my opinion. Because bottom line, I'm a loser. I'm a loser. You constantly lose. I am Finstoff. Andreko lost to Bibiani. I can beat Unfeka. Makuga has done it. The second that I'm done beating Makuga, Dagnino's back in the lead. He taught Matt Makuga a lesson. He learned who's boss. Yeah. Tom Dagnino is back in the league. I want him to be so humiliated that he doesn't want to come back because he's going to look so dumb. I remember that match drops tomorrow here on Collider Video. All right, guys, I said we'd save some time to take your live Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. Once again, just make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video. Wendy, what have you picked out? The first one comes from Box Office Jack, who writes, <laughs> Should film studios stop adopting book, adapting, sorry, adapting book series and go to TV only? Less quality versus faithful adaptation equals more views. No. No, some movies, I mean, there have been a lot of great movies that are based on novel adaptations, and they come across great. Remember, a lot of novels are like 400 pages. That's not going to get you a lot of episodes. That's like that's then taking a book and saying, I'm going to start a TV series based on the book, but then I'm going to do a whole bunch of different things. Sometimes it goes the other way. Sometimes you get a 1,000-page book that has to be reduced down to like 120-page screenplay at the same time. But no, I, I think every story has its own thing that it leans towards. Honestly, I think there's there's a real trend right now. It's real popular to say, oh, make that a TV series. And that's just like the popular go-to thing to say at this point. When I don't think that's accurate at all. I think a lot of stories, especially novels, do gear themselves more towards being movies. Some of them towards TV shows, but I don't think it's a hard rule that it's one or the other. I think every story you got to look at, evaluate on its own merits, and see which way it would go. I totally agree. I think, like, for example, a movie that I don't think that was done well, but still I thought was served better as a film was Girl on a Train. I don't think Girl on a Train could have been a series. I think that that, I mean, I think that they're talking about overall. You Didn't know, make much of a movie either. <laughs> no, I think they're, 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 they're talking more about like mortal instruments and things of that. Uh, I mean, just anything that, that could, Hunger Games, stuff that could just, there are certain ones that absolutely, there is a medium now, and I've been talking about this for a long time, and I, I agree with it. I think that there are Netflix and Amazon and all these streaming services give you such a different place to tell your story now in a way that, I mean, we're, Dennis and I, when we um, reviewed The Defenders, that is an eight-hour movie. It's an eight-hour film now that they're going to be able to really tell that story. And I think that there are certain times that that serves well, and there's other times where you can just cut a lot of things out from, from a novel or from a series and just make it a movie or movies. Perry? It's funny that you bring up Mortal Instruments because that's, that's the perfect thing to look at as an example. That movie came out. They hyped it up big time, and it tanked. And when they announced that they were going to make a TV series instead, I'm like, oh, God, did you learn nothing? That is never going to work. Should have led with that. Sure enough, though, it, it is doing okay. It's yeah. definitely not for me, but people seem to like it. And, you know, it's just you got to look at what your material is and decide where it fits best. Just to give an example on the other end of it, it's uh, Game of Thrones. Had you tried to cram Game yep. of Thrones into one movie or even a film series, I think, you know, TV is where that property should live. And it comes down to what you want to highlight from the story in the book that you're adapting to whatever medium you do. Like, you look at Jurassic Park. It's one of my favorite movies. Doesn't really follow the book, but it took the essence of the book and made it into a movie, and so there you go. Uh, you take It. It is, like, it's that thick. <laughs> and I'm currently reading It, and it, it does have ultimately two time zones that it takes place in. It's like when they're adults and when they're kids. And it looks like in this new movie, they're like, it's just when they're kids in the 50s, so we're just going to do that. That's great. It will be a bit of a different feel, but that's what they wanted to do. However, the old miniseries did both, you know, like the book did. So it, it all depends on what you want to do, what you want to highlight, what you want your movie or show to capture. Some books are doing well with it. Some would be better served as a movie. So context all right what's next arno writes have you heard that wonder woman is delayed three weeks in belgium and netherlands because of pirates of caribbean five opinions um 
Look, every movie Belgium. releases in different markets at whatever time. So, and they will often plan it around what the other release schedule is. This is standard operating procedure. Nothing to see here. I, uh, do you guys have anything to add to that? No, I'm not going to pretend I know how it works over there. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, as much yeah. as I have Belgium on my, you know, on my Facebook feed, I don't. So yeah. I, I don't know what's going on in the yeah. other. All right. I didn't read. I didn't read anything about that. But Power Rangers is a good example. It still hasn't opened in some markets. Really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah a lot of a lot and of mar movies, markets yeah. where it could make a lot of money too. All right, what's next? Jason You're Boyce so optimistic. <laughs> My fingers crossed. I want that sequel. Jason Boyce writes, do you think having Versus in a movie title has become a bit of a curse? For example, Batman v Superman, AVP, and Freddy vs. Jason. Well, Batman vs. Superman made Don't forget yeah, about so Eck Freddy vs. Jason. Money. So Don't Freddy forget about Eck vs. Sever. I mean, <laughs> one of the greatest motion <laughs> pictures of all time. Uh, no, that is not a curse any more than a one-word title movie guarantees box office success. I mean, it's just, it's just they, they happen to be used in movies that didn't do all that well. I, I don't think it's a curse. I don't think there's anything like, like that at all. Like, if you had named Captain America Civil War, uh, you know, Captain America v. Iron Man, the movie would not have been any less good or any less magnificent just because they did it that way. I, I don't think so. I don't know. Do you guys see anything in that? No. No. Well, no, no. Doing that like a month and a half after Batman vs. Superman came out might have, <laughs> might, <laughs> might have looked a little bit, eh, what are, you, what are you trying to do? But now Batman vs. Superman still made money. So, to so say, did Freddy vs. Jason. Did it really? Yeah. I didn't even know that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, at that point, it's no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's next? Tobias writes, now that you've seen King Arthur, are you more or less excited for Guy Ritchie's Aladdin? Are we allowed to say anything yet? Embargo! Uh, I mean, I, I just tell you what I said on my Twitter. I really like the movie. Uh, that, that's all I said on my Twitter, but we can't review it until later. More. Uh, I'm actually even more excited for it now at this point. I'm, I, I think he fits more with King Arthur than Aladdin, but Aladdin's going to hinge greatly on the genie. And who they get to oh, do that? Oh, so, so true. It, it, it's like I look at genie, not even director. who, but how yeah, are they right. handling the genie? Totally. Is really going to be. A big I'll thing. say that I don't really want them to direct Aladdin, but that's that's not. Don't start reading into that. Mm -hmm. I I and this is you've never wanted really him to. Direct I don't Aladdin. think that, that his style would work for it. And even after seeing King Arthur, I don't yeah, feel that. Way. What I will say, and you and I had this conversation too, if his name got thrown into the Masters of the Universe uh, mm -hmm. discussion, I wouldn't hate it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think my reaction to King Arthur in particular changes my feelings about him directing Aladdin just because King Arthur is so different and it doesn't change the fact that Guy Ritchie has a very specific style. Okay, what's next? Travis Montgomery writes, is it ever too late to get into film school? I'm 26 and I want to write and direct. Any advice? Thanks. Love all the shows. No, I know, uh, I, I personally know a guy who decided to just change everything and at 48 years old went into film school and then ended up being a producer on a film. I mean, so no, I don't think it's ever too late to go into anything school, to go, I've got a really good friend of mine who's going back to law school now, or it's never too late, never too late to improve yourself, pad your resume, change course, change direction, never too late whatsoever. I don't know, what do you guys think? I totally agree. I mean, when I went to school, it was a whole bunch of people who were fresh out of undergrad, who didn't take any break, just went straight into grad school, and then I was with a whole bunch of people who had families and kids and I think if you're in a position where you want to be making movies and you need that kind of experience those kinds of connections anything as long as it feels like that's the right move for you just do it you're never too old to do anything you want to try to do and it's such as a cliched statement Rodney Dangerfield was in his mid 40s when he started doing stand up comedy so the same thing goes with film school or anything to you do what you got to do when you want to do it just stay on the path and get it done this notion that life ends after you're, you turn 30 is bizarre. It's just nonsensical. My 30s have been a lot better than my 20s ever were. So, yeah, if you're 68 and you want to do something else, do that. All right, let's take two more. Okay, Jay Patel writes, I know it depends a lot on factors, but how much does a single screening cost a movie theater? Hmm. Uh, you're right. It costs. It, there's a lot of factors that go go involved. I I, I really don't. It depends on the movie theater. Yeah. I mean, really, yeah. like how big is the theater? Is it a big theater? Do they have X number of staff per screen that they do air conditioning. That depending on you know, the air conditioning or heating that thing, the projectionist. You 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 accumulate and figure out the entire expenses of building, putting that together, and and maintaining the theater over the year. Then you divide that up over 365. You get a rough sense of the cost. It really depends. 
Today's movie theaters, though, that put so much into it with new screens and new sounds and new seats and staff and all that kind of stuff, it's, it's, ex it's an expensive business. I don't envy theater owners. You know, uh, it, what they'll do a lot of times is they'll have that one movie that's not making any money. It gets like a couple people a day, but they have to hold on to it. They'll cancel that showing, put the screening in there, so you have more people in the seats. Those people buy more concessions. So in the end, it can't even out. However, when they do comp popcorn and soda, they're probably taking a bit of a hit, but more bodies are in there so more people might buy some concessions so they could end up the day ahead yeah it's so funny like when you watch when you hear people when i when i was younger the movies cost six dollars to go to yeah but your feet would be stuck to the floor by the, <laughs> the time you were done you couldn't i mean there was no good treats they reused recycling uh, garbage bins for your popcorn they have been making improvements like you were saying too with the sound and, the, and this in general the technology is the technology expands the prices are going to expand because you're getting a better experience when you go to the theater um but yeah it really depends it depends on the city uh, it depends on it, it depends on a lot of different things yeah I, they kind of have to make all those changes now when you can sit at home and watch everything oh, yeah. and when those uh, the release windows are shrinking and shrinking so it definitely costs them a lot more money to put on screenings but in most situations, I think I'm getting my money's worth, not counting what, how I feel about the actual movie that I'm watching, but in terms of you know sitting in fancy seats, getting a great projector, great sound, I'm pretty happy. All right, last question of the day. Last one comes from Elijah M. Turner, who writes, if you were an actor and had a guaranteed role in any movie, what genre would it be and why? Um, like most guys probably a sports movie of some sort <laughs> sports movie or superhero that's it that's what guys want to do and what they want to be i don't know what do you yeah think? i agree no. you, you'd be in a sports movie yeah you, you would not be in a comedy you would no. be in a comedy? star wars no. movie? why would i Come be in a comedy first of all i would not be in a star the question is would if living in one for real or, or being being, being in, in one, one. Yeah. 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 i would never I, would, I keep saying i would not want to be in a star wars why movie. I don't want to know what's happening. I don't want to know what's going on. I and I don't want, want to ruin it. I don't. I don't want to know. <laughs> I, don't want to ruin like, it. I was on set for Ant Man, right? And I got to see Ant Man stuff, and I loved being there and watching it. And I don't want to know that for Star Wars. I don't want to be a stormtrooper and then be spoiled, knowing what the hell is going to happen. It's like it's like, yay! There's my face for five seconds. I'm like, I want to watch the movie. Comedies, no, because there's not a lot of great ones. <laughs> um, uh, I think sci uh, a, a sci-fi fantasy would be kind of cool, but horror movie. Yeah, horror well, movie, that's no. where I was going to go. I mean, Star Wars would be my first pick. It I don't really care nice. about it get it getting spoiled. I want to be in a Star Wars movie, but I would also love to die a gruesome death in any horror movie. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun, too. All right, guys, that'll do it for this installment of Movie Talk. Thanks so much for joining us. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, over there, Miss Perry Nemiroff. Perry, where can people find you? I am on Twitter and Instagram, at P. Nemiroff. And as always, every Saturday, there's Collider behind the scenes. This one's all about food, and it features all these guys right here, so you're going to want to see it right beside me mr jeremy johns you can find me at jeremy johns on youtube twitter rest of the internet you can find my show awesome tacular on the go 90 network where harloff and i talk star wars we also do a lot of fun nerdy stuff is this freaking you out <laughs> right here christian harloff yes it is jedi council drops a little bit later today also the schmodown couple things going on with the schmodown obviously dagnino versus makuga next tuesday is the title match between the patriots and the wolves of steel a lot of great stuff coming up over there, we got Natasha Martinez. You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at NatashaLexis underscore. And Wendy Lee. The Movie Couple channel on YouTube and at Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. And apparently you can find me on Facebook and on Twitter simply at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And until next time, bye-bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.